Riley, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Show. This is a show that was started by the team for the Landscape Photography theme page on Google Plus, and Margaret Thompson was the one who started this. And we have with us today our distinguished guest, David Marks, who has been with us before and actually shared with us Google Earth. And today we're going to be talking about black and white photography, Lightroom, silver effects, and editing. So this is going to be great. I um, am a, a small business consultant. I just started a new page. I have asked everybody so that I can separate my photography photo by, photos by Cara. And I um, love and have been so inspired by all of the photographers here on Google Plus pushing me to, to another level. And each one of our team members is going to introduce themselves. And then we'll get right to David. So Margaret, we'll start with you. Hi everyone, I'm Margaret Tompkins from Kansas City, Missouri and it's a real uh, pleasure uh, to be with you this evening and I'm real excited about our show. Uh, I'm one of these people that think in color so I don't understand black and white but I certainly appreciate it and I would love to be able to do some of the uh, beautiful shots that I see on Google Plus so I'm really anxious for uh, David to give me some tips and tricks that will just really uh, improve my uh, black and white ability so I'm so looking forward to that. Uh, I'm an amateur photographer and retired, so I enjoy uh, taking photographs. Uh, we're still recovering from uh, snowstorms here in the Midwest, so I hope to get out soon and start taking some photographs. So really great to be with you and uh, honored to be here. Thanks, Cara. Great. And now we have Jim Worthman from Phoenix, the Phoenix area. Thanks, Cara. Um, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm an amateur photographer as well. Um, like Kara said, based in Phoenix. Um, I like to do mostly landscape work, both color, but uh, I have a special place in my heart for black and white. So I'm really looking forward to uh, David's talk tonight. Um, yeah, I think I think black and white uh, is is my. If I had to have a preference, it would be black and white over color. Um, and uh, so looking forward to it. You can find me on Google Plus, uh, Jim Warthman, and my uh, photo portfolio is down in my lower third. So thank you. That's great, Jim. Thank you so much. So here we go. Uh, just a little summary of the last time David was here in Google Earth. He showed us how we could go navigate to a location where we were going to be on a photo shoot and watch the sun. And uh, you know, it was about four weeks ago and I was uh, in um, Palm Springs and so wanted to do a photo shoot in um, at the uh, Joshua Tree National Forest. And so I spent three hours, maybe four, trying to figure <laughs> out how to do it. Then I got in the car, drove 45 minutes, found the place I wanted to be for the sunrise. But I did see how it worked, and I really enjoyed the um, the lessons. And so David is uh, an instructor for the Rocky Mountain School of Photography. Margaret has taken classes from him, and uh, really, so really good classes. Everybody. Really good classes. David's great. Says. And uh, so hopefully this will inspire those of you who are watching to uh, start investigating different classes, different things to take. It's, it's wonderful that we can share here, but again, there's lots of homework. So I'm going to introduce David, and uh, thank you so much. Where, where are you coming from uh, tonight? Where are you located physically? Uh, I'm at home in uh, Whitefish, Montana. Okay. Uh, uh, 120 miles north of Missoula, about 100 miles from the Canadian border, uh, headed to Fernie, British Columbia. Well, uh, and then you, you uh, do, what, before we start though, you were in Antarctica. Tell no, us what, what. No, no, what, I wasn't in Antarctica. I was at the edge of the Arctic Circle. Oh, the um, Arctic Circle. Okay. Yeah. No, no, Antarctica is, uh, I would love to go to Antarctica, but that's even more exotic. 
That's uh, painful, okay. isn't it? Well, two, two minutes, tell us what you did there. Uh, I was leading a, a Aurora photography workshop oh. uh, this uh, spring, summer, fall. Basically, this year is, is going to be one of the peak times for the Northern Lights. And um, I had the opportunity with a, with a partner, a, a guy I teach with down in Yellowstone, to take a group of hardy, uh, awesome students up to uh, Churchill, Manitoba. And we, we were treated to like five out of six nights of something amazing in the sky, uh, three really good light shows. And, and I just had the, the best students because... You know, it was negative 20 Fahrenheit, negative 40 with the wind chill. The aurora doesn't often come out. Uh, you know, the aurora doesn't happen at 7 in the evening. So a lot of times it was 2, 3 in the morning, and we're standing outside. I mean, these folks refused to go in. They, they came to see, they came to photograph the aurora, and they were up all night, and they couldn't have been more fun to travel with. So it was, awesome. it was really a treat. Um, well, that gives us all something to put on our to-do list. Shoot oh, man. the Aurora Borealis with David. Okay, I got it. <laughs> well, if, if not with me, um, this year, next year would be a great time to, uh, to go north or south, I understand. I've not, I, I've hear there's now a southern Borealis as well. Um, but the, the higher or lower in latitude you get, the more your odds of seeing it. Yeah. Uh, That's the Aurora Australis, I think. Yeah, it's something something I just learned about. But now I'm thinking tip of Argentina. Uh, how how far does one have to go? Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you so much, y'all, for for having me back on. What a, what a pleasure. Um, uh, last time I was here, I talked about uh, Google Plus and and sort of the um, you know predicting where to go photograph. Very um, sciency. Uh, sort of, I'll go ahead and call it dork material, um, geeky stuff. Uh, tonight I'm real, real honored that, that I get to come back and talk about some of the uh, more art, I guess, side of photography. And part of, part of what I love about photography is that it really is both, you know, it's a technical art. So we learn uh, on both, both sides of the brain. Um, and so tonight I, I wanted to talk about something that I really enjoy, uh, which is black and white photography. And and sort of for my history, um, you know, when I was a photography student um, 10, 12 years ago, I was trained in a darkroom. And I wasn't any good in the darkroom. I'm, I'm certainly not going to claim that I had it mastered. No. Uh, I was a student. Uh, I, there were a lot of tears. There was an awful lot of paper that went right into the trash can. But I loved the, the time in the darkroom. And you know, that, that magic moment where you put a piece of paper in the chemistry and you agitate gently, and suddenly this image uh, magically appears. And when the digital came around, I was happy to jump on digital because, Lord, I was spending so much on film and paper that, uh, that it made sense to go, to go that route. But I really sort of missed or, or have been missing the, the way that black and white tells a different story than color. I work a lot in color, you know, like we were just talking about the aurora. Uh, that's all about beautiful colored lights in the sky. I live in Montana because of our, uh, you know, I'm right by Glacier National Park. Gorgeous sunsets, rich greens. But, but black and white tells this, um, this other type of story that I find sort of fascinating. Um, so, can I, should I show a little slideshow? Oh, yeah, yeah. Please all do. Right. Uh, I'm going to start the screen share. Let me know, please, if this works, because unfortunately, when I start this on my end, I can't see what's going on. So yes, you're there, see. and it, it's perfect. We can we're see in, it. We're into Lightroom. All right, so let's see. I'm going to hit play, and let's see. Does uh, hopefully little title slide appears? Yes. Black and white photography. Yes, it awesome. does. Awesome. So I like to use black and white photography, you know, in my own work for a couple different things. I like it for portraiture, and and here. Uh, you know, weddings, uh, people photos, uh, it tells a very, I think black and white makes it easier to tell a human story, uh, an emotional story. There's a reason that photojournalists run around, even today, with the best of digital cameras, but choose to print in black and white. Now, myself, I'm kind of an outdoor sports landscape guy. I love the way that black and white gives my adventure sports photos, like this one, a very different look than than they would have uh, in full color. Margaret, for you, I picked some Grand Canyon images. 
Good. Uh, well, no, uh, we, we're still stuck on cool. the black and white photography um, there it goes. title page. Right. Well, here, let's see if, uh, I, I never know if it's going to advance or not. Let's see if this will work. Now you, I think you have Grand Canyon. All right, uh, but you missed we some missed portraits. Your, we missed your uh, action shot. Uh, so here, let's see. Uh, did you see this one? Yes, the portrait uh, uh, wedding. Wedding portrait. Been there, been there, seen that, done that. Uh, been oh, there. We just are now seeing it. All right. Um, so some portraits. Uh, I guess I'll manually advance it. Uh, uh, portraits. Um, still on the first portrait. Still on the first one. The wedding one. Wedding one. Okay. Uh, well, let's try it this way then. Um, I'm never clear what will work on on this hangout. Uh, you're on this one. Yes. So we're, we're back to the wedding. Now okay. we're a little girl. Awesome. Another wedding shot. Okay. Uh, uh, a little girl wedding. Uh, couple. Yep. Uh, yes. Excellent. All right. Seems now, like a couple um, in the by the water. And yes. Mountain. Seems like manual advancing is the secret here. To, to okay. keep it simple, I, I've got to learn this. Don't let it advance itself. The Google, <laughs> the Google Hangout won't pick up on it. Oh, uh, now here's the action shot. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, uh, hopefully, chair lifts in the snow. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Uh, so this is my favorite activity. You know, I live here in Montana for a reason. I love skiing. I love skiing around with my camera. Um, and photos like this in full color, well, it's basically a gray sky, overcast, snowy day anyway. It makes sense to me to try and tell the story in black and white. That's almost the way my eye sees it. Um, and, and what I'm saying is, Whoa. you know, this is, is shot in full color. He's not wearing a white jacket. He's wearing a, a red jacket. But... I love that in working with these as black and whites, that I can give them a very unique, very different look. Um, you know, again, this is this was originally shot in full color, but processed into uh, well into a world of gray, uh, grayscale. Um, let's see. Uh, hopefully. Oh, would that be forty shades of gray? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Humor, humor. Okay. Um, oh, I love this one. Yeah, and and. and Margaret, I think that uh, for folks who who photograph the desert, uh, Grand Canyon, Utah, you know, high noon is a very harsh, direct, uh, hard light, and it's very hard to get rich color out of your rocks, your your skies. You know, that desert light is so harsh that we hate to take our sunglasses off. But underneath that harsh light is beautiful shape, shadow, line, pattern, texture. Stuff that black and white can express, even when the color data, you know, without the color data. Um, Is this Lee's Ferry? Were you, was that other one there with the raft uh, at Lee's Ferry? This is below Lee's Ferry. This is at the mouth of the Little Colorado and the main okay. flow. Uh, but not, you know, a couple days from Lee's Ferry. That almost I've been happened. swimming there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple days downstream. That almost has an infrared look to it with the dark sky. Funny you should mention that, Jim. I was going to uh, mention that I so love black and white photography that uh, I had an old digital camera converted uh, mm -hmm. to shoot into the infrared part of the spectrum so that it behaves uh, more like black and white infrared film would uh, than, than, uh, than, a, than a traditional digital camera. Um, and you can go the conversion route which costs a couple hundred bucks, or you can buy a glass filter to screw over your lens. Um, both have their ups and downs, but I, I really love the way that the infrared response uh, does stuff like, like this. Um, it's the infrared response that's making this field of wheat uh, glow almost paper white. Yep. Um, and, and I loved black and white infrared film in the darkroom days. I was terrible at it. Uh, it's a miracle that any of those photos ever worked because uh, it's so complicated. You know, it's, it's in the darkroom, it's a very temperamental substance. Uh, but with the digital camera, you can try it. If it doesn't work, you hit delete. You try it again. It doesn't work, you hit delete. And by the fourth, fifth, tenth try, hopefully you get to something, something like this. Um, uh, hopefully you guys are seeing like a field of wheat. Of course. We are. 
Awesome. Uh, again, this is totally the infrared response. It's the it's the beyond the visible spectrum that the camera can pick up on. It's picking up on the the photosynthesis process, the the absorption. I can't remember if it's absorption or reflection of UV light in that field of wheat. So this is shot under pretty uh, late afternoon hard light, um, hard shadows. You know, high contrast light. I don't know that it would be a winner in full color, but to the black and white camera, it's perfect. And I think what you know, it's that contrast. And it's that ability to stop seeing a blue sky and start seeing pattern, line, shadow. It's things like that that black and white can do so well for us. Uh, you know, again, um, full color, it's not a bad photo, but we miss out on the texture, yeah. I think, of that hay bale. Yeah, uh, the texture's awesome. Yeah, that black and white, once you take the yellow of hay away, your brain can focus on other attributes of what we're seeing. Um, for uh, vegetation, you know, glow, uh, growing things, the infrared, it makes anything living and growing in direct sun uh, glow almost paper white. And so one of the tricks that, I, that I've learned in shooting it is to try and find a mix of living and non-living. So like the barn in the lower left, the infrared effect doesn't change it at all. The barn absorbs no, you know, no infrared radiation, no UV radiation. So it doesn't change. It's a dark red barn. It's a dark gray barn in black and white. But the trees glow, and so we get this real high contrast uh, between the two. I find infrared is great for architecture, for um, for travels, because I, I, the other one of the other things I love about it is it gives it sort of a timeless quality where we can't tell if these photos were shot today, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, you know, that when we take away sort of the modern digital thing, like this could be an old photo or a new photo. It, it moves our sense of this had to have been shot recently. I feel like digital camera color photos, they're beautiful. I love my, I love my 5D Mark III. Uh, I love my color camera. But everything I shoot with it looks like modern digital where this could have been I don't mean to claim it as a darkroom photo but I hope it has more of a timeless feel and I hope that fits in this case with the you know Great Smoky the old Tennessee split rail fence log cabins when you're photographing old stuff sometimes photographing old stuff but giving it the look of a new camera seems kinda odd to me and you know, uh, the other thing that black and white does, or one of the things it can do, is it can sort of transport us to this otherworldly sort of dreamscape feel. Uh, this is a, a tree and some sort of vine that I saw in Hawaii. In full color, it's beautiful, but it looks like uh, a, a dirt road and some trees that I can sort of put together. But in black and white, I feel like it has much more of a, uh, almost like a land of Narnia fantasy feel where I'm not as uh, able to associate it with the world that I see every day. Now, now my real passion is in landscape photography. And for this, the black and whites are, are so great to me uh, because you can focus again on texture and pattern. You know, rocks and desert grasses. Um, in color, none of this stuff is all that vibrant. They're gray rocks. They're kind of dried up brown, you know, very arid environment. But lose the color and you can see the, the sort of contrast of living and not living, the, the pattern on the desert floor. Or this is a rainy gray day in Montana. That's uh, Lone Peak. For, for local geography, there's a ski area. Big Sky is up there. It's a beautiful mountain, um, but on a rainy, drizzly day, gray on gray on gray to the color camera. But in black and white, we can see this pattern, I hope, of tree and mountain and snowfield and just a very different mood. Um, also here in Montana, uh, this is headed to Yellowstone, one of our wilderness areas. I love the way that when there's no color in the photo, I hope that your eye follows that S-curve in the little creek yeah. and that, that line, that shape becomes a dominant theme. Where in a color photo, if you can imagine this in color, I bet your eye would be drawn to the blue sky 
at the top of the frame. The blue sky in this case to me is really the least interesting part of what, uh, of what I photographed. Um, the bottom of Zion Canyon, uh, gorgeous place in color. Absolutely love my, my color camera at Zion. But I also love the, again, the timeless feel um, when, I, when I go colorless, when I go without the color. Uh, we'll do just a couple more of these. Uh, glacier, um, love the, the sense of mood that black and white gives uh, this kind of landscape. Yellowstone, um, I have a, I, I'm, I'm sort of a repetitive guy. I love photographing rivers and, and river bottoms, the little curves they make. So I work that theme again and again and again in my photography. Uh, but here, uh, I bet some folks know this one. This is the Mammoth Terraces at, uh, in Yellowstone. Um, you know, a million tourists a year are going to see this zone. Um, but take the color away. This is shot at basically high noon. And I, I think I'm going to get a very different mood, a very different feeling out of my photo than the people who I'm standing shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder with on the, uh, on the main boardwalk. And, uh, you know, one last, one more of those little hot springs in Yellowstone. Um, old Faithful? <laughs> not Old Faithful, but similar zone. This is out by Yellowstone Lake. This is what, an area they call West Thumb. Um, Old Faithful has the geysers. West Thumb has more of the boiling pools. Um, but, you know, and, I, and I, I'm lucky enough that I live in Montana. I get to photograph these places, not every day, but fairly regularly. And every time I've gone to West Thumb, I've thought, or Old Faithful, this is such a surreal, otherworldly landscape. How do I make otherworldly photos? And color makes that harder for me. Uh, black and white seems to help. So here, uh, hopefully you can see my my very short little advice slide. Um, my advice slide is, if you're interested in black and white, you have to shoot in RAW. You're not going to get full potential if you set your digital camera to JPEG. Uh, for the best black and white you can do, we need that, we need everything the sensor can capture, because we've got a lot of tweaking to do. Then, when you're out there thinking with the camera, when you're out there working, think about line, shape, shadow, texture, emotion, because those are the things that black and white can, can express so well that are different than what our color camera does. When, we're, when I'm teaching classes on color, uh, I, I talk about thinking, you know, I, I teach my students to think about saturation and warm and cool color and how this color complements or counteracts that color. In black and white, think highlight and shadow. Think soft, rough. Think line, curve. Because uh, that's what you're going to get, you know, hopefully going to get in your finished product. And then if, if I have one last, it's when you're working on your black and white photos. Remember that in a black and white image, your viewer's eye will be drawn to the area of highest contrast and sharpest detail. Now that's no different than a color photo. Uh, except in a color photo, we're drawn to high saturation. But still, the eye loves contrast, it loves detail. The difference here is, when you go to work on these black and white photos, if you want the eye to go to, say, someone's face, that's got to be sharper, brighter. It's got to stand out in terms of its shade of gray, its, its contrast level. Let's see. Let me, uh, let me uh, pop out of this, if I can. Uh-oh. Uh, there we go. And uh, let me just check. The trouble with the uh, screen share full screen is I can't see what you guys are seeing. Let me just make sure everybody's still there. We're good. We're here. Awesome. Yes, uh, and we see you now. <laughs> awesome. Uh, questions? Um, uh, ideas in there? I have a couple of photos too. I'll show you how I tinker them. But uh, before we push buttons, I figured. Better, better ask if there were concepts, thoughts, questions. Yeah, uh, I, I like your your idea, David, about um, focusing on on lines and shapes and textures, yeah. because and it seems to me that, that that's one of the difficulties of visualizing when you're when you're in the field is if it's especially a colorful scene, the colors you know, kind of automatically tend to take over for us. So I, I think it takes practice and, and you know, some, some working at, at your suggestions to, 
actually get to see or, or, or visualize what the final uh, image might look like when you just think about shapes and textures. It's yeah. hard. Uh, you know, it, it takes a... Uh, uh, in some ways, I, I would say that working with black and white photos is a little easier because who cares what the white balance is, right? Like, you don't have to sweat. <laughs> is it the right color? There isn't any color. So in some ways, working with the files is easier, but visualizing, pre-visualizing, thinking about what am I shooting here, that's a little different because our eye is drawn to color, and, and we've all become so trained you know, to, to photograph the, the most vibrant, the richest colors we can find, but, but there's this whole other world of possibility out there where we look for uh, the other stuff, and, and that's hard. Uh, it's especially hard when, when the digital camera really rewards that kind of color thinking. Everything looks more saturated. Everything looks higher contrast. We love our, we love our glowing color TV screen. Uh, where's my phone? You know, like how many glowing screens? I have my iPad over here. I mean, I surround myself with glowing color screens, and that's why here I, I don't know if you can see this, but like hanging on the wall. That's why, like, a black and white photo seems so, so different compared to the glowing computer monitor uh, that I'm sitting at. And so, I, and again, what I love about digital is if you bring me that raw file, if you bring that home, you have the choice of color or black and white when you get home. It's not a one versus the other, um, which is something different than we ever had in the film world. If you had loaded color film, that was color photo. If you loaded black and white film, there was never a, a really good uh, option. Um, and so that, that's part of why I think the raw file is so helpful here. It's also because we need that tonal range, that, the extra bit depth in technical terms that the raw file gives us. I really like your your advice uh, sheet there. And I, I honestly understand now why I'm not very good at black and white. And it's because I'm I'm shooting everything in color, thinking about color. But if I would occasionally think in terms of shapes and textures, and shoot for that, I'd probably have some interesting color, and I'd be able to make some interesting black and white. I I kind of get that now, and I didn't do that before, so that that's great. Well, and, and I find for myself uh, trying to create a photo of texture in color is really hard for me because I just get obsessed with the color part uh, yeah. and so you know I, I lose or visually I, I it's just that's a very hard assignment for me but in black and white it's not as hard um, um, other other thoughts other questions wanna sure I um I really liked the the title that we had talked about thinking in black and white because you really do have to think differently and the, the hardest the one of the things that I think now it is connecting is that you have to have that contrast so when you're clicking it's like you need to have some real light and you need to have some real dark otherwise it really does blend into 40 shades of gray because there's there's no contrast unless you're going to be able to go into Lightroom and that's what you're going to talk about next is how we're going to get that white jacket that was red that gives that contrast that really brings up, brings our eye there but um, I, I really like the concept of thinking in black and white because it, it is different. Well thanks. Uh, you know it, it, it used to be that many years ago that photographers would even buy this uh, little filter. It was a, I can't remember what it was called but it was like a little, a little uh, acrylic Thing, and you could look through the world with it, and it would basically make the it would basically mute the colors of the world. And we would walk around, you know, when I was a photography school student, we walk around with our little cardboard square, <laughs> peering at the world as if it was black and white, because it is so hard to visualize how will the room that I'm in, full of colorful things, look if the color drops away. Um, well, here, let me uh, uh, let me grab the screen share again, if that's okay. Um, yeah, please. And uh, I know when, I, when I've when i tried to demo Lightroom uh, via Google Hangout in the past that it can be hard to see 
what slide or what button. So please feel free to say, hey, which which button are you pushing? Because uh, that that part often gets lost at the screen resolution. Um, and let me jump over to Lightroom's develop module. And for now, uh, let's say I brought home a full color photo. Um, because this is what I'm used to, not the desert every day, but this is the sort of thing I would ordinarily go and photograph. Uh, and just, just to be sure, you know, this is a raw file. It shot with a, a regular old Canon, no fancy tricks here. 40th of a second, f6.3, ISO 200, the usual stuff. No tr tricks. Now, I'm used to bringing this file into whatever program, Lightroom, Photoshop, and then I'm used to making it probably brighter, higher contrast, and probably more saturated, something like that. And I like this photo that way. You know, it's, to me, that's a very pleasing uh, full color photo. But that's not the only option that a photo like this gives us. There's more possibility if we take the color away. And there are two ways in Lightroom to take the color away. Option one, let's see if this will work. Option one is the, uh, does it zoom in? Does it show it zooming in? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So option one in most any program, Lightroom, Photoshop, iPhoto, whatever, is the saturation slider. Because that is the axis of color that controls whether something is neon or pastel or black and white. So if whatever program you have, if you pull your intensity of color down, you begin to go to pastel and then extremely muted. But when you get to zero saturation, 100% desaturated, you've entered the world of black and white. You're now at the world of gray. And, and a couple of things can show us this. One is the histogram in Lightroom. You'll notice that those color bars have all disappeared. Because when something has no intensity of color, when it has no saturation, it can have no color. Uh, when something is of zero strength of red or green or blue, it's a gray. So at this point, by desaturating, I've entered the world of, of grayscale, of, uh, of monochrome. And so now these controls for brightness, they really act on the tones of the photo, meaning this will take white tones whiter, this would take black tones blacker. So that's one method of getting to black and white is simply to desaturate. And this is what the digital camera does. If you set it to monochrome or black and white JPEG mode, a lot of folks in their camera menus will have a black and white mode that only affects the JPEG file but this is exactly what your camera did to you. It just desaturated. I mean, you know that most digital cameras, they're full color devices. So there's another alternative, though, with software like Lightroom or Silver Effects or Photoshop. The other option is a more nuanced black and white conversion. And so let me see if this will zoom in again. In, oops, uh, in Lightroom, I'm going to go to the. Oh, bother. Um, hang on one second here. Uh, David, just to let you know, we're not seeing the controls other than Zoom, but we don't uh, see any of the develop controls. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see. Forgot to silence the uh, cell phone. <laughs> no worries. Uh, <laughs> Put the note on the doorbell. Hit the other phone. <laughs> uh, hang on one second here. Now why hasn't that changed? Um. Interesting. Uh, hang on one second while I tinker on my end. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, whoops. Well, we can, um, 
right. Are you ready? Apologies. Uh, uh, let me just restart Lightroom. I'm not sure. Okay. It's like I was able to zoom it in, and it zoomed in, and then it never seems to have zoomed back out for you. Well, uh, we know that there are cyber gremlins. I'll even take the uh, <laughs> screen off of you. <laughs> cyber gremlins. They, they just happen. So any of you who are uh, experiencing a... Uh, hang out maybe for the first time just don't worry they will be there <laughs> I even oh, have that. pet names for them <laughs> yes oh we can, we can name our gremlins <laughs> <laughs> and so. depending on the mood you're in they can have good names or they can have bad names so Margaret tell us a little bit about um, your trip to the Bahamas oh it was cold it was uh, cold the cold yeah, it looked weather. great. The the uh, sh your yacht that you uh, my yacht yeah. with the helicopter that looked cold. <laughs> um, it um, uh, um, we were bundled up certainly. That was uh, the the cold weather just sort of followed us uh, in New Orleans. Um, they were covering up all the plants. It was uh, in the mid twenties at night, oh, and uh, I think they. Uh, I don't know if those plants made it or not, but that that's pretty cold for um, tropical plants and stuff uh, okay. around hotels. But are you uh, ready for us, David? Um, not yet. Can you see? Can you see the develop module stuff on the side? I yes. see it now. Yeah, we see All it. Right. And, and you can hear me. Okay. Small. It's very it's small. Very small. Uh, I'm scared about zooming in, but we'll try it again. Um, but but we can see it. I think if someone had um, were to follow these steps in Lightroom, they'd be able to get there. Yeah, right. and, well, and for anybody watching, uh, it's helpful if you take the Hangout screen to full screen. Yeah. All right. uh, well, so in Lightroom, you have a saturation slider. In, in most programs, you have a saturation slider. If you pull that down, you get to the world of gray. That's one method. The other method in some programs, Lightroom, Photoshop, Silver Effects Pro, is a, a more nuanced uh, black and white mixing. And what the black and white mixing will let us do is it will let us convert from the world of color to the world of black and white. But as we go, we can say to it that I want things like that tree. And the tree was yellow, orange, green, that when I go to black and white, instead of just make the tree gray, I want things that were yellow or orange or green to go very bright. So let's see if the tree hopefully glows bright on the screen. Right. Yep. The, tree, the tree is glowing. The tree is glowing. And the tree is going glowing because in Lightroom, I'm using the black and white mix tools to say to it, when you go from color to black and white, take things that are in this wavelength, the orange-yellow wavelength, and brighten them, lighten them. In traditional darkroom words, we would call it dodging. Make them a lighter gray than they would ordinarily be. And so I can lighten or I can darken. I'll take the red wall, for example. I'll make the red wall, uh, let me make the red, the red wall brighter. Or I could make the red wall much, much darker as I convert from color to black and white. So instead of just, you know, a straight take the color away and now we have gray on gray on gray, that's what desaturate does. By using the mixing tools, you can influence the conversion so that the values you're interested in, like here, say, the tree, go light, and the values that are of less interest, the wall, go dark and you know I've totally overdone it for demo purposes here the wall is way too dark but I bet there's a visual effect going on the visual effect right. is your eye is drawn to the tree right. and you can't look away from it and the reason your eye is drawn to the tree is that's the point of highest contrast where white and black bang up against each other where it's basically black on gray or black on black there isn't that level of contrast so to the human eye, there isn't that level of interest. So what's so neat about this is we can begin our conversion from the world of color, let me go back to the world of color, to the world of black and white, and we can sculpt and say, well, in my black and white, I'm going to want 
these things lighter and brighter and I'm going to want these things a little darker. Now I like to be a little gentle in the initial mix but I like to get it headed in the right direction so that when I push the the ordinary tonal controls in Lightroom and say make my highlights brighter, make my whites brighter, make my blacks darker, what I'm really doing here is adding more contrast to my photo. I'm pushing and pulling lights and darks away from medium gray. Let me give this guy some contrast. And so hopefully, with just a little bit of tinkering, uh, I can get to what I hope will be a fairly pleasing black and white. Let's see if, let's see if this, this, if this will display basically full screen. Uh, did that work? Yeah. Yes. Nice. Yes. Yeah. To me, a fairly pleasing black and white. And and here's our here's our straight out of the camera, or here's our straight out of the camera color version. Oh boy. Uh, so here's the 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 color version. This is not the straight out of the uh, camera. This is the enhanced color. This is the black and white. Hopefully, the screen will split, and we'll get them side by side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both tell. So to me, both tell a, a wonderfully different story. Um, I like the color one, for sure, uh, but I also like the quiet of the black and white one. I like the way that in the black and white one, I can notice these lines in the yeah, rock I, down I here. was thinking exactly the same thing. I'm looking at the, the lines in the, in the big rock face over there. That's, the uh, lines, the texture, yeah. uh, the sandy feel. And again, I like the full color, but in the full color, all my eye sees is red and green. That's, that's all I can see in the color one. I don't notice the, I don't pick up on the subtleties of that surface like I would here. Well, I think they're in the black and white. I want to go in that cave behind the tree because that uh -huh. line that goes behind the tree just draws my eye back there. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think in pictures, and I've already got a little guy back there, and a little gremlin person. <laughs> <laughs> Not a little guy. So, just, just <laughs> so, so uh, you know, for, for most folks, I'm going to say shoot in full color, shoot a raw file, bring it home, play with it, make the color version you like, and then save that and make a black and white version and see which one over time they're going to tell different stories, but see what story you find more, more captivating. Uh, now, for me, I, I was saying I've gotten really obsessed with this black and white stuff, and I had this camera converted to work in infrared. So when I was showing the little slideshow, it seemed like uh, folks liked this photo. Um, I thought I would show you how it looks out of my black and white infrared camera. This is what because I've I've had the I've sent the camera off and had them weld a special filter over the sensor so that what it brings home is not a color image anymore but it's a pink a reddish image. Uh, now again, you don't have to mail a camera away. You can buy a glass filter that you screw in front of your lens if you find this fascinating. When I get home, this photo is not quite a black and white yet. It still has a, a reddish, pinkish color cast. Um, so I'm going to take the saturation slider and pull it way down. Now when I do that, it might have been real hard to see in the photo, but do you see in the histogram how there was still some red? Right. Sure. Green? So that's the residual pink cast, the red cast from the infrared filter. So I'm going to get rid of that red cast. Now I have a black and white. I have a gray on gray. And uh, now I basically have all these tonal controls, how bright are the highlights, how dark are the shadows, to play with. And this is where really the fun, the sculpting comes in, because I can say how black should the blacks be. To me, that's a little heavy. But maybe I want them this dark, something like that. How white should the whites be? To me, that seems a little blown out. But I could back off to say something like this. How light should the highlights? And highlights are going to be stuff like the wheat in here. How light should these be? Or how dark should they be? 
and I can really put detail into my photo where I want the detail. Should I open up the shadows or close down the shadows? And, and it depends on the mood of the photo. The way that I would work on a landscape is very different than the way I might work on a portrait. Uh, landscapes can handle a lot of contrast. Portraits, probably not. Uh, something like this is, is headed the direction I would take this photo. Um, I'm going to add a little more, more contrast using the controls in the tone curve. Uh, more contrast controls in here. Uh, let's go something like this. Something like that. And we'll go for the heavy contrast version today. I bet that'll project better. So here, I'm going to try and split the screen again. Um, this uh, on the left is what my camera saw. It saw a pretty muted gray on gray scene. On the right is the incredibly high contrast version that, that I'm happier with. Now, I think it's a little overdone, but uh, amazing to me how the the detail can just be drawn out of this photo really working with one two three four five less than ten controls total because I don't have to worry about stuff like white balance I don't have to worry about saturation or uh, you know do I have the right color I have only shades of gray to play with make those grays expressive and the image can really if you'll pardon the pun, leap off the screen. Yeah. Like I bet, I hope there's a real three-dimensional feel up here, uh, yeah. higher than in front of, behind. Right, there uh, is in those mountains. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's the way the human eye, to the human eye, lights, brights move forward in visual space. Darks, blacks recede back in visual space. So it really, I hope, feels like this cloud is in front of that mountain. Uh, and that's the way that the eye is going to respond to to the mix of shades of gray. A light gray, or almost white, against a black, almost inky black. So, David, um, I don't know if it was in the green room, but we saw that picture that you, this one right there. It's behind you, isn't it? Yeah, 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 this one hangs can on the you, wall. Can you take it off the wall and show it to us? Uh, I can try. Hang on. Let me uh, stop the screen share here. Uh, hang on. Um, let me, uh... You know, since I'm the, the producer here, it's like, bring us the real deal. Because, <laughs> I mean, when you really see a, a photograph... Um... I saw it in that one shot, so I saw it hanging on the wall. Yeah. Now, how is that finished? Is that, what is, is it on canvas? What is it on? Oops. Okay. The uh, finish, is it on canvas or is it just a print or? Oh, got to unmute the microphone. There we yeah. go. Uh, okay. Uh, is it on so canvas this is or on, a print? Yeah, this is a print and it's on uh, metallic paper. Uh, it's on the uh, Kodak, uh, what do they call it, Endura Metallic. You know, it's a chemical print from a from a dark room, oh. um, and I picked the the metallic version, metallic paper, because it has a real shiny quality. It gives it more pop. Pull it, pull it back just a little, so we can get the whole picture. Right now, we're just getting part part of it. Something like that. Um, so but that's I'll, I'll tell you. Well, that's Thank good. You. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So this is where they hopefully end up. Hopefully, you like what you did, and you put them on the wall. That's so, awesome. David, uh, I have a Lightroom question. As sure. you're doing your conversions, um, I, I'm an Aperture user and, and Silver Effects Pro, not, not Lightroom. So I'm not familiar with, uh, do you have the ability to do selective adjustments? Supposing you wanted to have you know, a different kind of shadow detail in one area of your image than in a different area. Uh, you, you certainly can change the brightness, say, selectively in Lightroom. I mm -hmm. could, uh, like, uh, I could lighten the sky or darken the sky by using Lightroom's local adjustment brush tool or the graduated filter, um, which allows you to to make changes that 
begin here, say, and fade off sure. uh, down towards the bottom. But if you're really interested in that kind of precision, I, I love Lightroom, but other software, uh, Silver Effects Pro from Nick, Viveza, uh, if we were working in color, or Photoshop, Elements, or the big program, they really give you more local control. Mm -hmm. Lightroom is good, but it's not the end-all, be-all of, I want to change this leaf on the tree. Okay. okay. That's good. Uh, David, I have a question. When do you use this as kind of a pattern uh, when working in Lightroom to reduce the saturation slider, and then you start playing with um, oh the highlights and the shadows, uh, using the sliders on them? Well, so if I'm thinking in black and white, if I start with a full color photo, there are two options. One is to pull the saturation all the way down and then mess with the, the highlights, the exposure, the, the tone, the brightness sliders. The other option is Lightroom's black and white conversion toolbox. It's down there by the HSL panel. Uh, it's about third on their list. That's where you can, that's what I was showing with the, the desert tree, where I can say what had been green, I want yeah. it to go to light gray. Once I'm done in that pa panel, it's back to the tone box at the top. Uh, and, and I haven't really showed it, but there's software from Nick, Silver Effects Pro. It's gorgeous black and white software. It's yet another option. And I follow basically the same pattern in there. The buttons change. You know, their placement, their names change. But Nick has a whole bunch of sort of presets. And I, I go down through the presets and see if I find one I like. If I do, great. It also has a color filter box where I can pick what would happen if I change the reds brighter, the reds darker? I play in there. And then it has its own set of brightness boxes. So I, I this is a part where I experiment. And I experiment, and I experiment, and I experiment. And hopefully something I like comes along. Yeah. And I think Nick also is great with the way it allows you to apply selective adjustments. So you can, you can drop control points around and, and you know, kind of subtly adjust various portions of the image. And and since we're talking a little about Nick, uh, it's good to point out that yesterday Google uh, announced a huge price reduction on on their suite of photo plugins, including Silver Effects Pro. Uh, here, I'll, I'm going to show one more photo just real, real quick from the slideshow back here just a second ago. Uh, one of the things I love in the Nick software is its toning. So this one has like a sort of sepia, a warm brown tone. And it has uh, the little framing around it. Uh, now Lightroom has these abilities to a some degree, but I think that, that the Google Nick's toning and framing is just really, really elegant. Uh, so I often use it, uh, I often use it for a little extra polish. Yeah. So and great. Like vignette on there as well. It yeah. almost looks like a really old postcard. Yeah. You know, with the little frame around it and the sepia tone, it just kind of looks straight out of like 1940. And yet it was shot with a, you know, the latest and greatest camera of two, the latest and greatest digital camera of 2010. Yeah. Uh, but the latest and greatest digital camera full color thing didn't give me the mood I wanted. Uh, it had the look of today. And I thought, well, this is a, this is a photo that that timeless could be from the 1950s <laughs> will help. So the color's got to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, boy, this has just been so enlightening. <laughs> David, thank you so much. No, we, for... we need a word. Not, no, that's like for color, something for black and white. I know. I, I I just like that thinking in black and white. You know, that's just so. I mean, it's thinking right and wrong. You know, kind of. But anyway, it was just delightful. Thank you so much for coming back to share. And we're at our 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 point in the uh, show where we recommend 
certain photographers to follow or circle on Google Plus. So um, each one of us will have one to share and we'll, we'll go through here and then we'll remind everybody before we do that that our next show, we do this every other week, is April 9th and we will have an, a really interesting guest. Her name is Terry Verbickus and she is going to talk about stock photography and how um, photographers can start getting some cash flow with their photos. So I think people will really be interested in hearing about that. And uh, it will be at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. That's 10 p.m. for you on the East Coast and really late for those of you in Europe. So <laughs> Margaret, we'll let you uh, give your recommended photographer for um, this week. All right, let me see if I can do a screen share here. Uh, my recommended photographer is Summit Sen, S-E-N, and this little critter uh, is one of his captures, and it was um, uh, just voted uh, one of the top photographs here recently. Uh, Summit does a wide range of wildlife and nature photography, and he is just the nicest person to boot. So for the uh, few people in the world who have not yet discovered Summit Sen, uh, please uh, follow him. Uh, he's a delightful person, a wonderful uh, contributor and supporter of G Plus, and certainly one of the finest photographers uh, that is uh, on Google Plus. So he, he's a huge asset for all of us, and I just love his work. Well, thank you, Margaret. So um, come over here, and I'll share my screen with you. And uh, it's interesting that. Um, this uh, is in the black and white, and it was just a, a photo that was uh, posted by Hidaki Onoyama, and uh, he uh, is in um, Asia and just posts the most amazing black and white photos, uh, hundreds of people comment on them and um, so if you haven't met him um, we'll be posting in the landscape photography uh, all of the links to our recommended photographers so now we'll go over here to Jim all right a screen share so I'm gonna recommend and I'll see how I do on the name Hengi Kanjaro uh, he was born and lives in Indonesia, um, but he did spend time at Brooks Institute in California, got a degree from Brooks. Um, his work is uh, almost exclusively black and white, and uh, he has a, a very distinctive style. I would call it atmospheric, um, but just wonderful work. Uh, he has quite a number of followers on Google+. Plus. Um, but I would highly encourage you, if you enjoy black and white, go take a look at his work. And uh, as Kara said, we'll have a link in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you, thank you, Jim. Now, David. Well, I uh, I went looking for some of the black and white uh, photographers who who I think do the most inspiring work. And unfortunately, a lot of the ones I really wanted to find aren't on Google Plus yet. Um, so I, I'm going to mention a name that I can't show you on Google Plus, but James Knockway. He's a uh, photojournalist. Uh, his are the photos of famine in Ethiopia, war, uh, Rwanda, genocide. I mean, they're photos of things you don't want to see, but they are incredible and he uses black and white on purpose because it hits that emotional level. But I can't show you to him on Google Plus because he isn't here yet. So uh, I picked uh, Gregory Colbert whose work, let's see if I can share the screen here. 
uh, his work falls into that other side, into the sort of world of dreams. His project is, that he's been working on for many years is called Ashes and Snow, and it's this fascinating merger of um, animals, like elephants and people. Let's see if you guys can see can see that one. Um, oh, you went back to you. You, oh, you need to click sorry. screen share again. That's Apologies. Okay. Uh, it's those gremlins. Now they just run around. There we go. There we there, go. You got it now. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's it's uh, like a little boy reading a storybook to an elephant that's lying down, uh, and it's all in black and white, and it's been toned, and it's just his photos are things that my imagination runs runs wild on. So I thought it was fitting for tonight's theme. Nice. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed our uh, landscape photography show. And again, we invite you back on April 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern uh, Day, or 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And Terry Verbickus will be talking about how to make your photos pay in stock photography. So you all have a great weekend and we will see you on the night.